Fantastic. Well, welcome everyone to the December 2020 virtual field trip to Sandy Ridge Reservation. My name is Michelle Brocious and I will be your bird walk leader this evening. A, a quick note in case um, any of you are new to the program and don't know what this is all about. Every month I select a location for members and guests of Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society to visit independently or with uh, members of their household. And then I ask everyone who went to report back to me uh, something of their visit. Uh, usually I, I get bird lists, I get ph photography uh, and journaling, I, but I can um, receive any other items like poetry or anything to do with your visit. Then I compile those into a scrapbook that I'm going to share with you this evening. All right, a little bit about the location. The Sandy Ridge Reservation is a 526 acre wetland and wildlife preserve located in North Ridgeville. Since opening in 1999, the park has become one of the most popular sites for birding in Lorain County. The Wet Woods Trail leads through a wetland forest where visitors may spot wildlife, including white tailed deer, fox, squirrel, and the elusive great horned owl. This normally, this normally quiet stretch of woods provides a front row seat for spring amphibian songs and the warbler migration. After less than a half mile, the Wet Woods Trail connects with the Marsh Loop Trail. The Marsh Loop Trail is a 1.2 mile trail that circles the wetlands of Sandy Ridge, a dike enclosed restoration area. The expansive marsh habitat along with open water and scrub shrub wetlands is home to a number of waterfowl, wading birds, and shorebirds. Bicycles, pets, and fishing are not permitted on the Wetwoods and Marsh Loop Trail. Bicycles and pets are permitted on a handheld leash across the park on the Meadow Loop Trail. This trail offers a short one mile walk around the wet meadow, which is a great place to watch the monarch migration. And that is from the Lorain County Metro Parks Sandy Ridge Reservation webpage. And then a beautiful photo by Tom Fishburn of two bald eagles find purchase at Sandy Ridge Reservation. I'd identified a, a few target species for this trip for participants to, to keep an eye open for. Uh, the American tree sparrow is a plump and long-tailed. American tree sparrows are busy visitors in winter backyards and weedy snow-covered fields across southern Canada and the northern United States. Hopping up at bent weeds or even beating their wings to dislodge seeds from grass heads, they scratch and peck the ground in small flocks, trading soft musical twitters. Come snow melt, these small rusty capped and smooth breasted sparrows begin their long migrations to breeding grounds in the tundra of the far north. And that is the description from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And I included the link to more information about the tree sparrow there. And then another beautiful photo by Tom Fishburn of the American tree sparrow at Sandy Ridge Reservation. Now I also identified winter waterfowl, which is a, a broad term. Waterfowl are typically described as birds that have flat bills and webbed feet, such as ducks, swans, and geese, that require an aquatic habitat. Winter waterfowl are those described birds who are found locally during the winter season. I gave two examples of winter waterfowl in the description for this field trip, so I'm just going to review what those birds look like, uh, but any waterfowl uh, were acceptable to be listed as target species for this trip. So the trumpeter swan, trumpeter swans demand superlatives. They're our biggest native waterfowl, stretching to six feet in length and weighing more than 25 pounds, almost twice as massive as a tundra swan. Getting airborne requires a lumbering takeoff along 100 yard runway. Despite their size, the swan's endangered, now recovering species is an elegant, is as elegant as any swan with a graceful neck and snowy white plumage. They breed on wetlands in remote Alaska, Canada, and the northwestern U.S., and winter on ice-free coastal and inland waters. Again, that description is from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And I just have this note to add that the trumpeter swan adult is all white, whereas juveniles are duller with gray-brown plumage. The juvenile's duller feathers on the head and neck will continue into the spring. Uh, so the photo there that Tom Fishburn took of the young trumpeter swan stretching its wings at Sandy Ridge is, as, as he noted, a, a young one, a juvenile. So that is why you see a little bit of a dull uh, 
brown-gray color on that bird. And the American black duck was the second example I gave. The American black duck hides in plain sight in shallow wetlands of eastern North America. They often flock with the ubiquitous mallard, where they look quite similar to female mallards. But take a second look through a group of brown ducks to notice the dark chocolate brown flanks, pale grayish face, and olive yellow bill of an American black duck. Numbers of this shy but common duck declined sharply in the mid-20th century. Hunting restrictions have helped to stabilize their numbers, although habitat loss remains a problem. Again, the description from the Cornell Lab. And we, although the American black duck was sighted by several people attending uh, the field trip, no one got any pictures of it. So Tom Fishman was very kind to let me borrow this from a few winters ago, 2017, a picture of an American black duck in Summit County. So thank you, Tom. All right, diving into participant submission. So Marianne and John Henderson birded three times at Sandy Ridge and identified 40 species over their three visits. Our first visit, she says, was on December 8th. The temperature was 32 degrees Fahrenheit and it was overcast and chilly. Tim Fairweather, the park director, was leading a small group on a walk around the ponds. We saw 31 species of birds, including five duck and three hawk species, plus the local pair of bald eagles. When the walk ended, we stayed at the ponds wanting to get a better look at the ducks while the group returned through the woods. While they were walking, they spotted two great horned owls. We visited again the next day. This time we brought the scope wanting to get better looks at the ducks. We saw 26 species, including seven species of ducks, the pintails being our favorite. The local sandhill crane also made an appearance. He is very nonchalant about visitors. I have attached a photo that I took in October. He was walking alongside me down the trail through the woods. Tim had told me, uh, Tim had told us that a late common yellow throat warbler had been seen near the end of the woodland trail. We missed the bird on both visits, but saw pictures another birder had taken on December 9th. While we did not see any blue winged teal, those two have been reported recently. And she provides a tip. If you're carrying a scope, consider parking near the back entrance in the Sandy Ridge housing development on Songbird Lane off Center Ridge Road. This will put you closer to the ponds and you won't have to carry your scope as far. And she provided a picture of the Sandhill Cranes at Sandy Ridge Reservation. And then here's her picture um, of the Sandhill Crane, the, the really friendly one walking next to her and her list uh, for December, the 8th, 9th, and 22nd. So I went ahead and highlighted all of the target species and then a few others that I thought were notable. So the Canada goose, trumpeter swan, northern shoveler, American widgeon, mallard, she had over 200, American black duck, northern pintail, green winged teal, and hooded merganser all fall within the waterfowl category. Uh, also the sandhill crane is a good one, the great horned owl, I highlighted the brown creeper because I think that's a really cool little bird. And then the American tree sparrow is the other target species. And we had a new participant this month. Very exciting. Eric Prose visited Sandy Ridge on December 18th at 1 p.m. and provided a handful of really awesome pictures that I am excited to share with all of you. So here are two of the pictures uh, on the left, lake scene at Sandy Ridge Reservation, and then a picture of an eastern garter snake at Sandy Ridge. Now this didn't come labeled, so I went to the Ohio Division of Wildlife Reptiles of Ohio Field Guide to try and identify it. I believe it to be an eastern garter snake. And this is what they have to say about the habitat. The most common of Ohio's garter snakes is found across the state, found in moist areas such as the damp woods and grasslands and the edge of ponds, lakes, streams, and rivers. Well, that sounds exactly like Sandy Ridge. So I think, I think it's the eastern garter snake. And I provided a link to Reptiles of Ohio field guide there if you're interested in exploring the other reptiles in the state. Two more amazing photos by Eric, another lake scene on the left and the sandhill crane on the right. And another lake scene on the left and my favorite hawk, the red-shouldered hawk on the right there. Very nice picture, a very, very nice pose of that bird. 
And then a close-up of the sandhill crane on the left and another lake scene on the right-hand side. Another a picture of the lake uh, and some of the, the, the dead tree uh, there and then a picture of the sandhill cranes flying over Sandy Ridge Reservation. I'm trying to see, I don't see, I don't think Eric is on the line. Eric, if you are on the line, if you want to say anything about your pictures, please do so. Otherwise, I will move on. Okay. All right, uh, the next participant, Alan Rand, uh, birded on December 20th and identified 34 species. It was cold and not much was happening, but there were signs of wildlife, saw the work of a beaver and mother nature after the most recent storm. Lots of birds at the feeders up front and mallards dominated the ponds. House sparrows were the most numerous songbirds. Golden crown kinglet and brown creeper were surprises since most have migrated by December. Got a nice close up look at a red shouldered hawk having lunch. There are his two pictures of the hawk. And then here, Al took a picture of the beaver activity on the left, and then the storm damage. You could see the tree just kind of snapped on, on the right there. And then a really nice photo of Northern Shoveler. Really like that close-up photo. And then his bird list uh, saw a variety of waterfowl, the Canada goose, wood duck, Northern Shoveler, American widgeon, mallard, and American black duck. And then the brown creeper, which I highlighted because I love that little bird, and American tree sparrow. So Al did get both of the target species. And then he took a picture of the lodge at Sandy Ridge Reservation. And then here's my submission. So I visited Sandy Ridge on December 29th. I usually wait till the last minute, it seems, when it comes to these. Uh, I think that just, you know, I, I spend the beginning of the month putting these together and then I have this call and it's already pretty much halfway through the month and so, you know, I really, then I move on. <laughs> so it ends up being the last half of the month that I always visit the location. But anyways, I found 16 species at my visit. Uh, I visited Sandy Ridge Reservation on Tuesday, December 29th from 8.50 to 11.20 a.m. It was a cold morning at a consistent 28 degrees Fahrenheit the entire duration of my visit, but at least the sun was out, making it a lovely morning and encouraging a flurry of bird activity. Tufts of titmouse as well as red-bellied and downy woodpecker were present on the wetwoods trail leading to the wetland. When I arrived at the marsh, I was instantly greeted by a multitude of sparrows along the marsh loop trail. I usually take the marsh loop trail clockwise, but since the activity was to my right with no visible bird life straight ahead, I veered from my habit and took the trail counterclockwise. In all, I counted 25 song sparrows along the entire loop and one swamp sparrow. The swamp sparrow was not a lifer for me, but this is the first time I located and identified one myself, which is almost as gratifying as finding a lifer. Uh, so there are the, the two pictures I got of the swamp sparrow at Sandy Ridge. However, never fear, I stopped to observe more sparrows a little further along the first leg of the trail when a brown creeper caught my attention. This is indeed a lifer. Uh, now you all know why I keep highlighting brown creeper throughout everyone else's list. Uh, I watched this little bird for several minutes as it creeped up a few trees before disappearing. As I moved along, the second leg of the Marship Trail proved to be a good location for dark-eyed juncos. So there's my brown creeper on the left with my life for award, and then a picture of a female dark-eyed junco on the right. And I did a little research to um, find out if this is a female or a juvenile. And uh, it, you know, you more experienced birders can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe this to be a female because it seems the juveniles will have more brown streaking on the chest. And I didn't see any brown streaks here, but it does have the light head, whereas if this were a male, it would have a darker head. So I, I figured this was a female. All right, six American goldfinch were spotted on the third leg of the loop trail. And then as I was rounding the final corner, a white-breasted nuthatch got my attention from within a grove of trees with its ick-up call. 
A flock of Canada geese then descended upon the marsh. I never thought I would be thankful to see a Canada goose, but I hadn't seen any waterfowl or American tree sparrow yet. So this flock meant I had in fact achieved an observation of a target species for this field trip. A Belted Kingfisher also flew in a few moments later, which is always a great bird to see. After taking more pictures of song sparrows, of which there were plenty, I headed back down the wet woods trail toward the parking lot. I decided to take the connector trail around the pond near the nature center to see if I could log any additional species for the eber list, and it was worth it as a black cap chickadee was seen. In all, I had 16 species, 144 individual birds, and a very pleasant, although chilly morning. Sandy Ridge Reservation is beautiful and full of life any time of the year. And there on the left is a picture of the white-breasted nuthatch uh, that I saw at Sandy Ridge Reservation. And then here are some of the pictures I took. I think all song sparrows is what I'm going to show you from here on out until I get to my list uh, because there are just so many. And this is the same bird. He was, or he or she was very cooperative. I probably walked away with at least 60 or 70 pictures of this bird, and these six are what I chose out of that to publish. And then here's another song sparrow caught in a breezy moment. And I loved how the the wind just picked up the feathers and you can kind of see the the under feathers there. That was really cool. And then another pretty song sparrow sitting by some berries. And that last my bird list and another angle of the brown creeper that was my lifer. So I saw a Canada goose. That was the only target species that I got that day. I saw the belted kingfisher, which is just a notable bird, the brown creeper, my lifer. And then I was excited about the swamp sparrow because it was the first time I had identified one on my own. All right, now we're at Sean Missig's submission. Sean visited Sandy Ridge five times and uh, logged a total of 23 species. So he says, I visited Sandy Ridge five times in December 1206, 1212, 1213, 1220, and 1226 with all visits taking place between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. Sandy Ridge has been a favorite of mine since a friend told me about it early in 2020. The abundance of wildlife is astonishing to me. I have never seen so many species in one place that wasn't a zoo. I thought things would be different in winter, but I was mistaken. Yes, there were birds that had flown south and other critters that had gone into hiding, but the sheer amount of life still out and about was amazing. 12-6 was my best day, and I took the most pictures that day. There was still snow on the ground, and the temperatures were holding nicely for a few laps around the park. 12-26 was the worst day I was there. The temperatures plunged to the low 20s, and wind chills were below that. I love the cold, but this was even cold for me. I did find some life in the forest, though, as the trees provided much needed protection from the wind. Once you made it out to the main trail by the water, the wind cut through every layer of clothing and it was not comfortable. Even the animals thought it was too cold and the amount of time spent and pictures captured was very little. On the right there, a photo Sean took of the American tree sparrow at Sandy Ridge Reservation. And these are December 6th photos. So we have a song sparrow on the left and a dark eyed junco on the right at Sandy Ridge Reservation by Sean Missig. And I have two more photos a blue jay on the left and tufted titmouse on the right at Sandy Ridge. And I, I love that photo of the blue jay. It seems to be looking down its reflection that you can see there in the pool of water, which is really cool. And then the expression on that tufted titmouse's face. <laughs> It's just, it made me laugh. It's like, you looking at me? <laughs> so two very cute pictures. Uh, December 12th, uh, Sean took a picture of the, the bald eagle pair on the left, and then the eastern bluebird on the right at Sandy Ridge Reservation. And a beautiful photo here of Sandhill Crane at Sandy Ridge by Sean. And I like how it has the... Uh, Canada geese in the background. I think even a mallard way back there looks like. 
All right, December 13th, one of the highlights for me was photographing a belted kingfisher. On almost every visit, there was a kingfisher bouncing from limb to limb on the water in search of its next meal. I decided that I would watch this bird for a large portion of my visit, and I'm glad I did. I switched my camera into manual focus and waited for my shot. My patience paid off as I was able to capture several dive bomb sequences trying to catch a fish. I will always be fascinated by these birds and their abilities. And so then here is the sequence of the dive bomb. So right here, I believe, is, yes, that's the, the kingfisher right there. So it's, it's diving at an angle. So here it's, it's a little lower in its dive, getting lower to the water. Right here now, almost there. And you can see it's, its beak is just above the water, and then there's the splash. So very cool sequence of the belted kingfisher dive. You can all see my mouse, right? I think I was pointing, yeah, <laughs> hopefully. All right, and then uh, another Belted Kingfisher dive sequence that was taken just before the virtual field trip. I, I told Sean I would still include it because it, it's a really cool, um, but it was yeah on November 29th. So here is the, the Belted Kingfisher sitting here and then it jumps off and it's, it's going down into the water. It's right there. And there it is, almost in the water, and then it's halfway, it looks like, or at least its head is in the water diving. December 13th, uh, my trip on 1213 was full of many great pictures and it started off with one of the adult bald eagles perched by its nest. The eagle was just in my range and I held the shutter button down hoping at least one shot would come out. After this, I did not see any of the eagles again for the remainder of my visit. For as great as the start of the day was, Sandy Ridge had one more trick up its sleeve for me as I left. I was almost out of the woods when I saw a larger bird swoop in and land on a branch. I was too far away at that point to identify it, and I continued to move closer. I made sure to stop at many points on my way up the path to get shots of the bird before it potentially flew away. I continued getting closer as I went up the path, and I was ready for this bird to fly. It had definitely seen me by now, but still, st but still it stayed on the branch. I was practically underneath this bird, and it didn't have a care in the world. It was almost as if this bird wanted its picture taken. It stayed perched for quite a while, and many others got pictures of it as well. That bird was a juvenile red-shouldered hawk, and this was an experience I will never forget. One week later, I saw an adult red-shouldered hawk, and it was not as friendly when it came to pictures. I was able to get a few shots, and then it flew off into the woods. So then on the right-hand side here, uh, the left picture is of the bald eagle by the nest. You can see it's sitting uh, right above the nest there. And then the red-shouldered hawk, the juvenile, on the right picture. And here's two more pictures that were taken on, I think, December 13th. A great blue heron on the left and a fox squirrel on the right at Sandy Ridge Reservation. December 20th, 1220 yielded less results due to the water being mostly covered by ice. However, as I walked to the path, a great blue heron flew low to the water and was fairly close to where I was walking. I have seen great blue herons my entire life, but never that close. Their wingspan is very large for how compact their wings get when folded. This was truly a breathtaking sight. I also saw a large flock of gulls standing on the ice that appeared to be resting. Most of the other waterfowl and birds were not out during my visit. Sandy Ridge is an amazing place to visit any time of the year. I will continue to frequent this location, expand my knowledge, and hopefully capture more of its beauty. And there on the left is an amazing shot of the great blue heron in flight uh, by Sean. And here are a couple more photos I have. I placed the juvenile red-shouldered hawk on the left next to this mature red-shouldered hawk on the right, both photos taken by Sean. And then the species list, the American tree sparrow, and then we have a, a picture of a white-throated sparrow at Sandy Ridge by Sean. And then more notable ones on the second page here are the Northern Shoveler, American Black Duck, Belted Kingfisher, and the Red-Shouldered Hawk, Juvenile and Adult, all were notable. And another picture of the Red-Shouldered Hawk at Sandy Ridge by Sean. And that again is the Juvenile one. Nancy, we're at your slides. Would you like uh, to take a stab at it? Sure. 
Yeah, I was really hoping to get out more than once, but with weather and holidays and other things happening, I was only able to get out once on uh, December 11th. And um, with, with, um, it was really nice. Uh, I like Sandy Ridge because of the, the path around the wetland. It's flat, you know, there's a, a viewing platform plus a, like a little viewing hill. So you can get, uh, a, you know, lots of views of things. And um, I, I don't take pictures of the birds very well because all I have is my little old camera on my phone. So I take pictures of other things as well. And as I was uh, going through, um, you know, I was got there and I said, you know, it's get almost Christmas time, and you know, what 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 do we think about the colors of Christmas? You know, do you think uh, red and green? Do you think silver, gold, blue and white? Well, yeah, I started thinking, oh, one of the things that I like about the holiday time is the red color, and you know, when I got there. I was greeted by several things that were red. First of all, uh, a red-shouldered hawk, that juvenile, was perched really, really, really close to the parking lot. And, um, and I dove into the vegetation shortly after I had uh, gotten my, my scope and myself ready. So it probably was you know, going after a, a rodent of some kind for a meal. Whether it got it or not, I don't know, but it didn't come up. So who knows? So we got red there, and then um, well, I'm getting ready to go onto the Wet Woods Trail, and red-bellied woodpeckers are calling, and then immediately after that, a red-headed woodpecker was calling. And I, I don't know, um, I had to leave for uh, just a second. Did, has anybody mentioned red-headed woodpeckers on any of their lists yet? I, I didn't think so, but, yeah. but I, I will tell you, they're, they were like, all over the place on December 11th. Not when I first went. They were really, really high up in the trees, so it was really hard to see them, but they have a distinctive call, and they were calling and calling, and, you know, I could see them moving around, but didn't really get the best look at them as I was walking in. So we got red, we got the red shoulder, we got the red belly, we got the red-headed woodpecker. Um, and then um, right near the nature center, there's the songbirds visiting the feeder, the titmouse, chickadee, uh, juncos, and things of that sort. Um, so and heading through the, the wet woods, you hear the blue jays, there's the nuthatch and downy woodpeckers. So those were a few things that were cited. Oh, and my photo of the red berries uh, on a, a, one of the rose species. I thought that was pretty for the, for the holiday. Uh, next slide, please. All right. Hold on. i got to click on it. There we go. All right. Um, oh, thanks for the photo, Tom. Um, so when I got to the to the uh, wetlands, um, there were a huge number of waterfowl, but uh, mallards, uh, American black duck, and Canada geese were the, the main ones uh, encountered first. Uh, there were a few songbirds, the, the song and American tree sparrow, so I guess I hit waterfowl as well as the tree sparrows, some of the target species. And then a single bald eagle is perched near the nest, but uh, when it flew from the nest area over to the wetlands and landed on a, a dead snag, it was just, you know, just spectacular. Oh, the day was sunny, by the way, too, so it was really, really nice. Um, the northern shoveler were around. Uh, hooded mergansers made a, made a nice appearance, some green-winged teal, and a single male wood duck, so that was nice. Um, I had taken my scope, and you know, carrying the scope around is is kind of cumbersome, but but it was really nice to have because I could really scan the the, the wetlands and, and see what was out there. A uh, few other birds that utilize water, of course, the, the kingfisher that other people have mentioned, great blue heron, and the gulls were ring-billed gulls that I happened to see that were there. Uh, so I, I took the trail. Mm, uh, I guess clockwise, yes, clockwise, and uh, the viewing hill, uh, again, song and swamp sparrows, along with American goldfinch. Uh, it was nice to have a, a small flock of bluebirds near that little viewing hill, so that, that, was, that was kind of fun to have. Uh, again, more tree sparrows as I'm rounding the backside of the, of the trail, 
And because there's more brush uh, rather than the, the water, so there's more brush, more more grasses, more weedy things, which the sparrows seem to like, like the tree sparrows, uh, white-throated sparrows, song and swan sparrows, and and the uh, juncos. So they seemed agitated. I didn't know if it was because I was walking by or there was something else that was that was uh, uh, making them kind of upset, but uh, it made it really nice to see them. Next slide, please. Oh, yay! I thought I was going to miss the sandhill cranes, but I was able to get them. They were really, really, really in the far back corner. And, uh, but, you know, you have to pass by a, a housing development, and uh, apparently some feeders at the housing development uh, provide food for things like the cardinal, jays, house finch, house sparrows, and a lot of the other feeder uh, visitors, so woodpeckers and so forth. So the cranes, yay, I was able to get them. And, uh, you know, sandhill cranes and blue and uh, great blue heron look an awful lot alike. Um, just a little bit of tidbit of information. Great blue heron are pretty much uh, carnivores where they're eating fish, frogs, snakes, that poor garter snake better watch out too, um, insects, things that tadpoles. But cranes, they will eat some fish. They will eat some, uh, you know, uh, invertebrates. But they'll be rooting around in the in the wetland area for roots. They'll go out into farm fields and eat uh, waste grain like corn. So again, they're they're a lot more omnivorous and even leading a little bit more towards being more uh, uh, herbivorous, so like uh, eating more plant materials. So uh, so that's really kind of nice that I was able to see them. And then another red-shouldered hawk, which I think some other folks had gotten nice photos of uh, as I was rounding the last part of the uh, of the trail so it was really it was really quite nice I don't know if you put in some of my other slides there yeah um, what was really interesting is uh, I saw the the beaver cut and I can't remember who else had a photograph of the the beaver the log that had been cut down and uh, then the beaver dragged it across the trail and so the far right photo shows the drag marks of, of the vegetation and stuff, the mud, as, the, the, as it would drag that tree into the, the wetland and use it as uh, a food for future uh, as part of its cache. Um, you can see the, the lodge there in the, in the kind of almost in the middle of the, the wetland and then all the vegetation that it cached around that lodge. But what was unusual is that uh, I didn't think beaver ate oak trees a whole lot, and this was an oak, a small oak that was cut down. Uh, so, well, maybe it decided it was going to drag it in and use it as a Christmas tree. I don't know. So, uh, so that that was kind of fun to see because I had not seen beaver out at Sandy Ridge uh, before. I hadn't been there for a while, but uh, this this was the first real bit of evidence of, of the beaver. And uh, again, more sparrows, more woodpeckers. And when I was ready to leave, walking through the Wetwoods Trail, the red-headed woodpeckers came really low. And I tried to get a picture with my phone because they would, the woodpeckers would land on a fallen log in the, in the forest or be against a dark tree trunk. And it, their, their colors are just like, just beautiful. So, but I wasn't able to catch because they were always playing peekaboo, you know, I'd get my camera up and they'd be around the uh, back side of a, a, a limb or they'd fly off. So uh, didn't get a chance to, to get a photo of the red-headed woodpeckers. Maybe somebody else has um, that's going to be coming on later. And then uh, again, returning to the parking lot, that red-shouldered hawk was, was up in a tree and there were lots of photographers taking pictures of it. So maybe one of you were there that same day. Thanks, Michelle. Sure. And then here is Nancy's bird list. Uh, the notables were the, the Canada Goose, Wood Duck, Northern Shoveler, Mallard, American Black Duck, Green Winged Teal, and Hooded Merganser were the winter waterfowl, and then American Tree Sparrow. So you hit all the target species, and you got a lot of great waterfowl when you went, so that's fantastic. And then um, thank you to Tom Fishburn for the Northern Shovelers in Flight photo on the left there.
And Tom, here is your submission. I didn't hear it. Nancy, how many species did you have? Um, I think I had 31 species. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, I can't remember. On the, can you back up to the to my list? Sure. Well, uh, let me go back to the habit. Oh, oh, okay. 31. You're 31. Right, 31. Yeah, I was right. Okay. All right. From the front. I missed mean, that. Yeah, I, I didn't do very well with the number of species. Everybody seemed to do much better, sell more birds than I did. I went twice, and um, it was, both were pretty cold days, and there was a lot of ice um, on the uh, in the marsh. The first time was uh, two days after that big snowfall. I went December uh, 3rd. Uh, December 1st was a real heavy snowfall. Um, but still had a still had a blast going there. Um, so um, I I was thrilled to see the sandhill cranes. You know both times. Uh, the first time was just the one, and um, you know I, although some f uh, folks think that the single uh, crane is one named Kevin, I'm I don't think anyone can be sure um, of the December birds, and I. Uh, uh, I did contact him, Fairweather, who wrote that he can't tell males and females apart. Um, he mentioned that the female had been there for 20 years when it started laying eggs. One died this year, and they're unsure which one. Um, but he, he's kind of guessing uh, it, it could be the female because the one that remained um, interacted with the other uh, the third sandhill crane that was hanging around. Um, and so he was thinking that maybe there, they are two males, but he's not sure. Um, on the 22nd when I was there, I spoke to another uh, fellow because that day I saw two. You know, uh, Tim had mentioned that the, the resident uh, had left. Uh, the one that um, was there um, um, I guess for years, um, so not real sure where this other bird came from, um, but uh, maybe maybe the resident didn't leave, but, or maybe this other bird you know, found a friend. Um, so I, I was disappointed that I didn't see uh, more variety of uh, waterfowl in particular, but um, could be because of the what balloons were frozen both times I was there. I um, was really happy to see the northern shovelers on my second visit. Um, on the first visit, I saw the two eagles and um, the second none. Um, so I, I overall had two uh, two good visits there. Anyway, uh, next slide. Right, so I just want to jump in really quick and say that <clears throat> after Tom's first visit, he emailed Tim Fairweather, Senior Naturalist and Park Manager at the Lorraine County Metro Park to gain further insight into certain aspects of the park. And I thought that was just so great. Tom copied me on the email. So I have awarded you, Tom, with the WCAS Press Badge. Okay. Uh, so that's what okay. that is there. So yeah, and then the rest I, I right. um, structured as an interview. So you can go ahead and take it away. Yeah. I just wanted to introduce that. Yeah, uh, you know, Sandy Rich has history. That, it, it, between the eagles and the sandhill cranes, um, uh, you know, I thought it would be good to try to get some um, information from Tim. He was really good about responding. Um, you know, so one of the things was all the, the trees in the wetlands area that there's actually a lot fewer trees out there than, than before. So I asked him about that and he said the trees have been dropping over the years. They died over 20 years ago when the area was flooded for them and uh, their toppling was inevitable. Um, I was wondering since I was there on the third if maybe um, there was extensive damage with that heavy snow but he didn't indicate that it was that. Um, so I think just over time this trees have been coming down. But you know, he mentions that they they remain useful for purchase. You know, for the eagles, uh, alterns, egrets, kingfishers. I never saw a kingfisher when I was there. Um, but 
this eagle here was out there the whole time I walked around that first that first uh, visit, and uh, so he, that one was sitting out there. Uh, next slide. So I was happy to see the sandhill crane. I, I, this is what I wrote to Tim. So so Tim says the resident pair we've had here for the past 20 summers nested again this year, but again unsuccessful. Have never been successful, from what I understand. Not long after that, though, the get a call from a neighbor for an adjacent housing development about a sick crane, sick crane in her yard. <clears throat> so he followed up with Tim Jasinski from the Lake Erie Nature Science Center. Found out that the crane died, um, but he wasn't sure if it was the male or the female because they didn't sex it. Um, so we had one of the resident birds remain through the fall. By the, by the way it was acting, I'm assuming it was the male. Uh, he kept chasing the other crane away. The female, uh, on the other hand, would have been over 20 years old based on what, when she first arrived here and started laying eggs. And to answer your second question as to when they leave, I was wondering, I was surprised they were still there. Uh, so he says they normally end up uh, leaving November, beginning of December, when it starts freezing up, and they come back in March. And this is where he said that the resident male is now gone for this year. Um, so this was after my first visit. And then later, there were two. So, you know, maybe he was mistaken or maybe the uh, the other uh, the one. He's going to, I think, mention the, the, the second uh, one that showed up on the next slide, perhaps. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so I was asking about this bird named Kemp, and um, I, I did find out, uh, uh, I heard from Janice, that a girlfriend of hers named it Kevin after uh, Janice tried to examine the bird, and, the, and Janice was bit by the bird, but Jan, Janice was real good-natured about it, though. and um, so her friend started calling uh, this bird her boyfriend as well. And uh, so they were, they were having some. So I did mention the crane that has been still hanging out with the one that some people have given a human name to. Um, he says it's, he doesn't think it's a good idea to do that. Um, anyway, this bird showed up over a year ago and hangs out on the trail and sometimes by the front door of the Johnson Weapon Center. I experienced this bird too in October. Walking next to, came right up to me and was walking next to me like uh, the picture, um, you know, that was there uh, earlier too. Um, he says that there are uh, cranes of Florida, Michigan that get habituated to humans in places where humans are. The golf course the parks, they don't, they don't act very wild. Actually, seem very tame. So when I see people getting too close to this bird on the trail, I try to educate them as to why they should go. It's a wild animal, not a pet. But uh, whether that's Kevin or not, I can't tell you. But uh, I had a wonderful time photographing these uh, sandhill cranes this, this year. Uh, next slide. Okay. I asked him about the eagles because I knew there was history about the eagles. Um, so he says, this is the notice. Well, actually, yeah, I got to explain first that. I uh, heard one was killed a couple years ago, um, that an intruding female uh, came in. And he explains that um, back in April of 2018, he uh, sent a notice out to everybody to explain he understood. A non-resident female eagle attacked the, the resident female. The resident female was found later on the roadside in North Ridgeville and taken to Lake Erie Nation Science Center to rehab the guy. The non-resident then chased off the resident male and then took the eagle in. Apparently it had hatched uh, that year and by all accounts dispatched it. I checked the nest this morning. This is April of 2018. I checked the nest this morning and there were no adults or eagles. It's nature is nature. A similar thing happened out here a few years back. Matter of fact, the resident female that just died killed the original resident. People get attached to these birds, and 
sometimes things like a camera make it worse in these situations. Uh, Sandy Ridge had two totally different eagles nesting when they started in 2002, and we probably will again have different ones. But to think of where nesting eagle populations have come in Ohio since the 80s is mind-blowing. Um, you get spoiled sea eagles everywhere. He, he mentioned the camera, and I, I think he's referring to the, um, the, um, the, the camera that was on the eagle's nest, the webcam that was there for a while. Because people actually could see some of what was going on when I guess that attack occurred back in April of 2018. And, uh, so, um, but it was having issues uh, because of its remote remoteness and it was scrapped. Uh, but they also mentioned that the, the day after all that happened, the male, the resident male, hooked up with the non-resident female the very next day. Uh, and I guess that's the male that's still there. I'm guessing. Next slide. I was asking about the owls. I didn't get to see any owls. I'm glad some other people did because I know they have to there. He said, yes, great horned owls are around. But they aren't reliably eaten. Just got to check the trees because you might get lucky. They start nesting usually mid-January to February. And um, so I actually got um, the, the photo on the left is uh, of a great blue heron. But the, uh, the crane is in the background. That was on December 3rd uh, after it, it flew in. I was there. I heard it, and it came in and, and landed there. That's over by the corner where the residential area is. And then um, I was glad to see uh, on my second visit, I believe it was, when the, the trumpeter swans were there. I did also find out that this is the second year, I guess, that the trumpeter swans successfully uh, nested there. Um, I uh, contacted a friend of mine who said that uh, there were seven um, that hatched, uh, I guess, a year before, in 2019, and five in 2020. Um, so I, I was wondering if, I wasn't sure how fast they grew, and uh, whether these here were from a, a new hatch or from the year before. Next slide, please. And I did see the song sparrows by the ice. That was December 3rd. I just thought they were really, really nifty looking. And um, this is where I was standing when I heard the uh, uh, St. Hill Crane first come in. So next slide. And just a couple more pictures there. I got a dot hatch and another uh, great blue right there on the way out. I get, that got a few species, but not, not as, as many as I was hoping. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then the hawk. That's the I just want to say I love adult. these three pictures. They're just gorgeous. So I, I had to include all three that you took of the hawk because they're just it's, it's a gorgeous picture yeah, and a gorgeous Sean had bird. Really nifty. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean it, it was a great, um, great bird to see. I didn't see the juvenile. This is the only one I saw. And the the first time I didn't even know it was there. I was taking pictures of the Sand Hill Crane, and it was right behind me. I I heard some a blue jay making a racket, and I turned around and looked, and she, this this bird's right there. Uh, on my second trip, um, I saw it you know, right away on the same side, on that uh, western side of the marshland. Uh, and um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's just a, a nifty bird. I had, we had a nice one too, Nancy, didn't we? At, at Lake Isaac, I think that, that was there. But, uh, I've been seeing more of these uh, red, red shoulder hawks this season. Next slide. Okay, now this, here we go with the crane. I think these maybe are my second visit uh, pictures. Uh, the one on the left, um, as I was coming up, uh, I was happy to see um, it. And I decided, I'll take a picture of a mallard. Why not? don't usually do that too often. <laughs> but uh, that one with the crane behind it, I had to do. 
and then uh, Dad was foraging. He was relatively close to me. I had a, it was almost too close to get pictures. Next slide. Then around the corner, when I went, was heading out, then uh, that's when I saw the shovelers. I didn't. This is my second visit. I didn't see the shovelers. My first visit. So uh, did catch them flying, and I uh, just you know just love those big shots that they got there. And uh, actually had uh, met Karu up at around this time. She she was walking her little one um, uh, on this time, and uh, then that very shoulder hop to the passes real quick too. Love, love those shovelers, love the colors, and I was glad to be able to get some in flight. Next slide. Oh, and that, <clears throat> excuse me, that is it. So thank you. A big thank you to uh, everyone who participated. Marianne and John Henderson, Eric Prose, Al Rand, Sean Missig, Nancy Howell, Tom Fishburn, and a huge thank you to Lorain County Metro Parks for Sandy Ridge Reservation. Uh, Sandy Ridge is located at 6195 Otten Road in North Ridgeville, Ohio. Uh, I put that address right in my GPS and it, it took me right there. So it's, it's really easy to find. Uh, please visit wcaudubon.org for more virtual field trip opportunities. We have them every month. So if you like what you saw tonight and think you might want to participate or even just tune in next month, uh, you could check out our website and the information is right there. And this beautiful uh, picture of a sandhill crane putting on the brakes at Sandy Ridge Reservation by Tom Fishburn. So now I would like to open it up for discussion if anyone has any questions or Tom, Nancy, and Sean, if you have anything additional you would like to share about your visit, uh, please go ahead and take yourselves off mute and um, let's have a discussion. I wanted to say that, uh, Nancy, I did see the red-headed woodpeckers. I actually um, took photos of a juvenile and of an adult. Uh, but I don't think they made it in. I may not have turned them in either. I might have forgot. But I did see them, and they were definitely noisy when I was there. But it was very nice to see them. Yeah, yeah, especially when they greet you early on. I just want to thank everybody for the terrific photos. I mean, I, I'm like, oh, oh, look at that. Oh, look at that sandhill crane. Oh, look at that one. It's, it's, they're just lovely. Thank you for those folks who are photographers and, uh, you know, have the, the patience for that. I agree. A lot of great photographs submitted for this one. Michelle, were you going to mention the, uh, next month's, or this, well, this month's, uh, uh, oh yeah, you're, you are right. So yes, yeah, so this month, January, I'm inviting all of you and all of the Western Chicago Audubon members and guests to go to the Ohio and Erie Canal Reservation in search of bald eagles for the target species. There is a nest there. Uh, I don't believe the eagles are nesting yet, but they might start, um, I don't know hanging around <laughs> and and when I went I went in December just to, to scope out the location and I did see a few bald eagles flying around so they're definitely in the area so if you have uh, the time and, and desire please go and check that out uh, just um, I, I've heard that parts of the park are a little muddy so wear your boots yeah, I was there today and I was out there. I was out there over uh, on Sunday, and luckily it was frozen in the muddy part. So, but you can get okay. right up along the Cuyahoga River. And I'm not going to give anything away, but uh, I thought it was a little slow, and then boom, it picked up. I had a, a great time. So hopefully, I'll be able to get out at least one more time. Fantastic. And Tom, you said you're out there today. Yeah, I was out there t today in, um, and saw the nest, and uh, there's nothing on the nest, but there, was, there were um, several eagles around. But most of them, I always see it look like juveniles. Mm -hmm. But um, I did see one adult on my first trip earlier this month, and, uh, but that wasn't, it was flying down. 
um, I was glad you gave us a tip as to where to look for that desk because I didn't know where, the location of it. Um, something, something I wanted to do though with, with this uh, crane picture here too um, was give you an idea of what it sounded. We, we played around with the sounds last time, not, not very successfully. But what was interesting with, with this bird, this is, I heard it way before I saw it. And uh, see if you guys can listen to this, what, how it makes this noise. Did you hear that? Yeah, oh. loud and clear. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, good. It, uh, the blue herons, the great blue herons make some pretty loud croaking noises too, but, but the sandhill crane is pretty uh, unique. And uh, when I heard that, I was sure it was it was in the area, and um, so I was able to um, spot it as it came in to get that picture. Fantastic. Tom, with you playing that sound there, I, I definitely heard the cranes making that sound, but the first time I visited Sandy Ridge, so this would have been the first time I was exposed to the crane, um, it, it kind of gave me a flashback of uh, sounds from Jurassic Park and the Velociraptors in the movie. So it kind of scared me at first, but they're, yeah, they're wonderful that's... Wonderful That's comparison. Yeah, yeah. Well, they are related, right? Aren't today's birds the descendants of the dinosaurs? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we can totally see how that happens. <laughs> watch, watch out for Kevin. You think he's friendly. <laughs> oh, yeah. The first time I saw Kevin walking very closely to... Uh, me and, and others, I was definitely uh, quite scared. Oh, I, I'm not as scared, but I definitely maintain my distance and uh, let him do his thing. Yeah, I think personally, I mean, that didn't, I didn't see Sandhill Cream when I went there, but if a wild animal got that close to me, I, I think it would definitely make me feel uncomfortable because I know that's not usual or typical. Believe it or not, on the day that I went, it was pretty warm, and there were a number of grasshoppers on the trail, in the grass, and, you know, if the cranes are walking along there, they're just picking off those, those grasshoppers, you know, left and right. So, so, again, that probably is one of the reasons why at least one of them was walking along the trails a lot, because not so much because people were dropping food, but because it was, you know, easy pickings. Mm -hmm. well, that makes sense. A good observation. I had a visit back in, I want to say October, um, and I, I one of the greatest pictures I've taken there, and I was watching a mink just taunt the heck out of the crane, and it was running back and forth across the, path and the crane was just getting so terribly upset and angry and the picture that I captured the crane's wings are spread all the way out and it's looking at the mink as it's running back across the path and that went on for probably 20 minutes and I wish I would have recorded videos so that I could have set it to the Benny Hill theme because it was just that entertaining oh, yeah when when was this that this happened? Uh, I believe in October. Uh, I will October. check okay. my records here. No, I missed. I missed what month. It wasn't. So I was like, why didn't you submit that one? <laughs> that would have been a funny picture. Um, I hope you put that on Instagram or something because I would like to see it. Yeah, I can toss that up again uh, later tonight. Sure. All right, we're, we're coming up. It's 7.59, almost 8 o'clock. Any additional thoughts or questions before we wrap up today's call? All right, well, thank you everyone for joining me this evening. Um, have a great night.
See you next Thank time. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.